And so everyone, thanks so much for, for joining us again. This is going to be Flipit Advanced Processing. This is the second in our summer series. Uh, just as an intro to myself, I'm one of the co-founders here at, at Calypti, I'm a maintainer of uh, Fluentbit, um, about about 10 years in the Fluent ecosystem. So now about going going through uh, Fluent D and when that started all the way to, to Fluentbit. I'm fairly active on the community Slack and, and other channels. So if you're posting things and discussion and the GitHub, uh, very eager to, to answer uh, any of those questions. I'm also joined by by Thiago, who's also a Fluent Bit contributor, uh, you know, software developer with multiple uh, 15 years plus experience, and of course, uh, work on many open source projects. Uh, you know, one one example, creator of the NeoVim project. So, with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started here. The way we're going to do this is one for those who might not necessarily know much about Fluent Bit. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, then we're going to head into Fluent Bit processing. Uh, talk a little bit about advanced processing with FluentBit, uh, and then of course talk a little bit about some examples. So uh, showcase this working in real time. How does it work? Uh, how can you start to make use of that pretty much today? So let's go ahead and start into what is FluentBit. So you know we won't make any assumptions about how if, if folks know what what FluentBit is. But really started all with logs, collecting all the logs you can from uh, almost any source, tail, log, uh, TCP, and we've added metrics and traces. So really combining that entire observability data into a single all-in-one agent, uh, extremely high performing. So something that's written in C, that kind of kernel level type code, uh, and, and being able to collect that very, very high scale, maintain a very lightweight, uh, lightweight profile. Uh, and of course, it's more than just a, a simple pipe, right? We have not just A to B, but A to B with changes, with processing, which we're going to, of course, uh, dive into today. Now, don't worry, you're not the only ones using this. We've uh, been lucky to see a lot of folks adopting this, whether it's major cloud providers, observability providers, retail, uh, you name it, there's most likely FluentBit embedded somewhere across the organization or enterprise. And we've, we've seen about 8 billion plus uh, Docker downloads, which is uh, steadily increasing day over day. So one thing that we don't talk too much about and is, is super interesting is how can FluentBit get used from an architectural perspective? So we talked about it collecting a lot of these logs, metrics, traces, but uh, from a collection side, what does this actually look like? How does this get deployed? And really, it is something that can get deployed at the node side. So if you have a server, you have a laptop, you have um, a, a containerized environment, we can deploy FluentBit at that node level. It collects logs or metrics or traces from applications that run uh, side by side or next to it, and then routes it to multiple or uh, any end destination. So uh, going and sending data to Splunk, Elastic, Datadog is a very a specific use case or very um, well used used case. So folks who are leveraging FluentBit across hundreds of thousands of servers, this will be a very, very common pattern uh, and one of the more widely adopted ones for that. Now, uh, another is how FluentBit is also adopted as an aggregator. And from an aggregator side, the way we think about this is you're not just collecting data streams or collecting local information, but you're potentially processing that. You're doing some sort of transformation. Uh, you are uh, building heavier machines to handle high, high traffic flow. So instead of just being used as an agent, you can also leverage it as what we call an aggregator. And the nice thing about this is FluentBit can send data to itself. So you get to use the same exact binary, the same configuration, from the agent side to the aggregator side and support all the same end destinations uh, that you normally do with FluentBit as, as an aggregator. Now, how does processing in FluentBit work, right? It doesn't matter if it's an agent, doesn't matter if it's an aggregator. If we expand out FluentBit and we think about that workflow of how it works, it's got an input, it's got some parsers, it's got filters, it's got some buffering to make sure that data is reliable and, and, and sent to the correct place. 
and then a router that takes that data and sends it to multiple outputs. So you know, again, that's Splunk, Elastic, Datadog, OpenSearch, whatever it may be. And within that whole entire data stage of processing in FluentBit, there's multiple layers of, of where you can start to do some of this processing. So you can do it at the input side, you can do it at the parser side, and you can do it at the um, you can do it at the output side. Now, again, with FluentBit, the idea here is we're connecting all these sources and, and destinations, really servicing as that data backbone for your enterprise as you are connecting all of your data destinations, your your uh, your databases, your data backends, uh, also collecting that data. So as those tools are getting used, how do you make them useful? You plug data into them, you send them, them stuff as real time as possible, uh, making sure that we can connect as generic with uh, the systems you might already have in place. So things like TCP, HTTP, uh, if you have a specific vendor or technology, making sure that we work with that. Uh, common data structures, so if you're doing compression, GZIP, if you're using things like Apache Arrow, working with that, or um, Parquet, or, or other formats that are very, very well known. Uh, last but not least, right, the data types, as we mentioned, logs, metrics, traces, working with common things like Prometheus, working with open telemetry. Uh, these are places where FluentBit uh, excels because it has that really open, broad ecosystem that's built on top of this high velocity open source. So with that, let's talk about why FluentBit for processing. And in order to do that, we want to take a step back and look at how most of our users are doing processing today or how uh, folks in general do, do processing today, right? And in this, if you look at how do we, how do folks go and attack tech um, or attack processing today? We typically see a lot of complicated stacks with Kafka, Spark, Flink. You're using things like Kafka streams. And, and really, if we expand that out to look at what folks are doing, it can be simple things like, hey, I want to add a field name. I want to uh, do a small calculation. I want to do a redaction. Uh, and and there, we're leveraging really heavy Java processes. I mean, these things are meant for very mission critical streams of data, uh, looking at large swaths across time time windows. But many times we overuse and, and overcomplicate it for simple tasks. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of overkill. And you think about from a heavy implementation, like a full Java virtual machine, uh, it, it is something you have to train on, something you have to learn. Uh, and it's always post collection, right? So you're collecting the data, you're sending it to these systems and you're doing a lot of this processing today. And what we found is that as folks are building out these, these tech stacks with uh, Kafka, Spark, Flink, KSQL, Apache NiFi, um, they are adding to this, this complexity by saying, great, here's uh, all the SQL rules that run on top, here's all this uh, logic that we're building on top. Uh, and many times we can, we can bring that to the agent side. As we're collecting the data, how can we enrich it? How can we contextualize? How can we redact? Uh, and that makes it much, much more uh, appealing. I guess as a as a quick question for for folks here, um, if, if if you're able to put in the chat, would love to hear. Uh, you know, are you using Kafka and Spark for a lot of use cases today? Are you using it for some of the simple data processing? Uh, always interested to to make sure that we can showcase what we're seeing with these tech stacks with with uh, FluentBit as well. Now, what are the use cases, and why would you use FluentBit for processing? Now, the, the goal here is not you can get rid or, or, or dump any of those uh, highly complex processing stacks. No way. We, we will keep those for the, the use cases they're really great at. But for the simple things, the things that we're overkilling our systems for and overkilling our operations or developers or practitioners for, we don't necessarily need that. Um, what, what does this mean? Things like schematizing or formatting logs. If you want to parse, you want to format into Avro, for example, you don't necessarily need to write these giant SQL queries to go do that. If you need to do remove sensitive information as it's streaming, you most likely want to do it at the collection layer because 
That way it's never stored in a, a way that that sensitive information could get leaked. The all the greatness of those complex data tools is, hey, let's replicate, let's make sure this is highly available across 50, 100 servers. Well, actually we don't want uh, sensitive data to, to be uh, blasted across all of these things. Now, uh, excluding noisy logs, right? If we have a ton of, uh, uh, a ton of logs that are, are non-critical, things like debug, uh, like trace, info, things we don't necessarily need in production, let's remove it, right? Why pay for those egress charges? Why pay for all of that data transfer costs? Uh, if we can exclude it, it's not useful to you, it's clogging up the systems. Uh, and last but not least, context. Uh, at the agent and aggregator level, you are at a, a piece in the architecture that you can get really informative context like the host name or uh, what's happening in a Kubernetes cluster level, what's happening within this AWS environment, uh, uh, even GOIP. These are great places where you can plug in and add context uh, and not necessarily have to do that with, uh, with a large place. There's a really great question um, in, in the chat about uh, Kafka persistent storage. Can Flintbit do that? Is it possible to replace Kafka with Flintbit? Right. I, I, I'll, I'll say what I said before too. It's the idea here is you don't do a full replacement of these complex data stack with something like Flintbit. Does Flintbit have persistent storage? Yes. Can some use cases of Kafka be replaced with just doing everything agent side? Yes. If you're doing simple processing, simple storage, simple buffering, simple retries. All of that's included in, in, in Flintbit from an agent aggregator side. You might not need Kafka just as a, as a message queue or, or something like uh, servicing in between. So those are, are great ways where if you analyze what you're doing at each piece of the data stack, you can start to leverage uh, Flintbit in a, in a broader capacity because it's written, again, at that kernel level C, super high performance, lightweight, uh, gives you a lot of, of, of flexibility in, in what you might need to accomplish. So let's start talking about this processing in practice. So let's start with the most basic thing. So parsers. If we look at Fluentbit and what many users are leveraging it for, it's log files. Log files at the most basic level, just a giant stream of text, right? It's the text that gets output. It's someone, a developer maybe has written log.console, hello world. And as you are grabbing all of these logs and, and uh, all of this stuff that's coming in via, um, via these streams of data, it's important because we, we want to contextualize it for that operator or the practitioner that's actually looking at it. And, and for example, with the parser, there are very well-known formats of these logs. So in this case, I have an Apache log. It's an access log. It has an HTTP method. It has an IP, it has a date time. Um, I have MySQL logs that, that have databases, database engines, and then JSON, right? That's already in a key, key value format. So parsers, again, the most basic level of, of processing, these can allow you to extract these key values as you're collecting that data automatically, right? And many times these are out of the box. So with a lot of the parsers, that you might be using within a microservices environment, within um, a node, an agent, an aggregator, you're gonna have a lot of these built-in uh, parsers out of the box. So Apache, Nginx, Mongo, Kubernetes, Envoy, JSON, uh, Docker, CRI, CRIO, um, Istio, a lot of these come out of the box. And if they're not, the great part about this, this Fluent community is being around for as many years as we have, there's, there's a ton of parsers that are available throughout GitHub, through the Slack channel, through uh, um, in, in GitHub specifically, there are parser example files that have some additional type of um, log files and what good parsing rules for those might be. So if you don't have something out of the box, don't worry, you can define custom parsers as well. Uh, these are uh, parsers that live in the service section you can use regular expressions to do the extraction. Uh, and the great part is, say, for example, you are reading data that is uh, not generated at the same time, you may want to use the original timestamp of the data itself. And these parsers allow you not just to extract and, and create key values, but say, hey, the time of the original record is what I want to send to my backend. 
And when I'm doing a search, let's say, for example, an open search, uh, I'm, I'm searching for a time window of A to B. I don't want the ingest time. I just want to know when that record was actually written to disk and, and collected. So a custom parser allows you to do that. Now, a fun one is uh, that we, we get asked all the time is, hey, what about multi-line messages? So my processing is not just a key value pair, but I have these messages, as you can see here, that this one lives across six different lines. And if I just send six different lines to my backend, it's really hard for me to understand what happened. Um, I might miss what uh, line a, a stack trace occurred in. So I have to do some processing to say that this is a multi-line message and it should be captured as a, as a single uh, record. And we have a blog post that goes into a lot of detail about multi-line messages, but at a high level from a processing standpoint, we've also made sure that FluentBit can do a lot of these multi-line things out of the box. So you have multi-line parsers, you have a lot of stuff that's enabled for Kubernetes and doc with both Docker and CRI runtimes. Uh, then you can also tack on to that, hey, this is a, uh, this is a Golang um, a container, Golang stack trace, Ruby stack trace, Java stack trace, uh, or uh, a Python stack trace. And, and we've done our best to, to define patterns uh, that, that we think address a broad range of these languages. Of course, if we don't have something under the box, you're doing something really custom. You can also define these um, multi-line parsers. So essentially something that you have, it starts, this is the pattern that starts, and then here's the continuation of that. Um, so these are, are, again, great ways to go do that type of processing you might need from a sing simple log, log capture uh, that you might not expect, hey, I need some processing for. Well, actually, by doing this processing, you could streamline your operations, your right? How, how you're searching that data and how you're debugging and troubleshooting. Now the, the more familiar place of processing for, for those who are familiar with FluentBit is what are called FluentBit filters. Now this is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it's something adopted from the FluentD side. And when we think of a filter, we think of reducing or um, having it run through a strain, if you will, um, to, to use a, a water-based analogy. And the, these filters can actually do way more than just reduce or remove things. You can add, you can modify, you can do conditional statements, you can nest um, objects, uh, you, you can do lookups against a, a large list of IPs, a large list of domain names, you can do GeoIP lookups, uh, you can even talk to APIs. So Kubernetes is a great example the Kubernetes filter talks to Kubernetes and says, hey, who am I? What's my context? What namespace do I belong? Pod, container, all these things that are important in context of that application, it can add into uh, the, the log message. Now, here's a really simple example of, of a basic filter that does follow, hey, let's remove some of the stuff. And here, what we're doing is excluding a certain subset of logs that match a pattern. Uh, in this case, if anything uh, matches the pattern of my app, we're going to exclude it from what we're capturing. So these are these are the more common places where you essentially have a dedicated piece within your configuration that does this type of um, that does this type of uh, processing. So now let's talk a little bit about advanced processing with FluentBed. And for this, I'm going to hand it off to Tiago. Um, Tiago? Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking mostly about Lua. Uh, so as Enrag mentioned, uh, there is a lot of filters in uh, FluentBed, but uh, there is always the, those edge use cases, and for that we have Lua. Lua is a full programming language that can be used. That is implemented as a filter in FluentBit, and it allows you to do virtually any kind of processing that you need. So some of the highlights is that Lua has a very uh, readable syntax. It's similar to Python. Uh, it's a language that's very simple, uh, very limited syntax, and 
it, it's very easy to read and understand the code. Uh, it's also very lightweight. Uh, Lua is, uh, I think, might be the, light, the most efficient, most memory efficient scripting language that you can embed in a program. So given that FluentBit is uh, targeting the high performance usage, efficient users, uh, it kind of makes sense to use Google uh, as an embedded language. Uh, even though Lua is small, you can actually do a lot with just the built-in uh, built libraries, the standard library. It has a very uh, simple but efficient pattern matching language. Uh, pattern matching is, uh, in a way, similar to regular expressions, but it's uh, a bit more limited in what you can do. But it's it, it allows you to do a lot. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of people uh, that come to Lua don't like Lua because it lacks many uh, many common functions. For example, a very common function is to strip white space from from a string, Lua does not have a function that does something that like that. But the pattern matching length, uh, library, uh, when you start to get familiar with it, you can always find a one-liner that does uh, those things. So yeah, it's a very uh, small tool that allows you to do a lot with it. Uh, and Finally, Lua is very widely used in the industry. Uh, it's very heavily used uh, as a gaming scripting language. Uh, I think it's probably the uh, most used uh, scripting language for games just because of its, its performance, uh, but also because it's easy to embed into other, other problems. So a few examples are Roblox, World of Warcraft uh, for the older gamers. Uh, there's also Adobe uh, Photoshop Lightroom, which is an image processing uh, framework for Adobe Photoshop. And yeah, uh, these are some of the examples that Lua is more used than we tend to think. Even though a lot of people never heard about Lua, uh, don't know about it, it's very widely used uh, in the industry. Uh, so here is a very simple example uh, of a filter. Uh, this is a fluent bit filter configuration that uh, it defines a, a script, uh, an external file called append tag dot Lua, and it says that uh, this, it should uh, that fluent bit should call a function cb on the line filter in, on that script, and on the right you can see the the script. Uh, it's just defining a global function in Lua that takes the tag, the record tag, and assigns to the record as a field. Uh, so this is one of the simplest examples that I can think of. Uh, to learn more about the Lua API, uh, you can go to the documentation, but to, to summarize what is it's doing here, it's returning one which for fluent bit means it should process the record. Uh, it should take the modified record and replace uh, the record. Uh, if you return zero, uh, it's not, it's going to use the original record. So that's also a simple way to skip processing that record. And uh, you can also return minus one to drop the record. So uh, you can also use uh, Lua to drop uh, to remove records from the pipeline based on very complex criteria. Uh, so in this case, it's showing the classic uh, fluent bit configuration uh, that uses uh, the filter block in a separate script. But you can also use, uh, there is a, a second, uh, uh, the next slide, it's, it's, it shows how to, uh, how to, uh, 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 can you address this slide? Uh, so okay. in this case, uh, you, you can also show how you can put the script in line in the fluent bit configuration. 
uh, one of the limitations of this uh, this example is that uh, the script must be uh, in a single line. So you must reformat the script. For very simple processing, uh, this can work, but it might not be the best uh, uh, use, uh, example for everyone. But it, it, this example is this exactly the same as the previous, but it's simply reformatted in a single line. And instead of script, we specify the code uh, the directive. Uh, can you advance? So it, uh, Fluent Bit, since uh, I think version 2.0, started supporting uh, YAML uh, as a configuration format. Uh, uh, YAML is uh, much more flexible. Uh, uh, in, in, this, in this example, it's the same as the previous one. It's the code embedded into the, into the configuration, but we are using the block syntax from YAML to uh, do embed a multi-line Lua filter into the configuration. Uh, so yeah, it's basically the same, but yeah. Uh, uh, this, uh, this next example is showing uh, processors. Uh, what are processors? Processors are a new feature uh, for fluent bit. Uh, at first, it might seem like very similar to filters, but the difference is that uh, with processors, you are touching the, the Lua code or the filter. Uh, it doesn't support only Lua, but any fluent bit filter, you can attach to an input or an output plugin. In this, uh, normally, when you specify a filter, you can specify a match pattern. And that filter is only going to be applied to records that have a tag matching that pattern. When you define a, a, a processor uh, for an input or output, it's uh, always going to be part of that input or output. So uh, there is no match uh, specifier. So if you define a processor for an output, every record that reaches that output is going to go through that filter before it goes into the output. A string and the same for input. Uh, so it's a bit, uh, it might require a little bit of uh, knowledge about how fluent bit works to make more sense. But yeah, it's an advanced feature. And also, it's something that's only available for EML config. As you can see, uh, these are uh, EML configurations. Uh, you cannot do this with the classic configuration. Actually, real real quick, I, I see we're getting a lot of good questions both in chat and open. Uh, I think this is, it's a good place. Maybe we can answer a few of these. So one, um, uh, Francois, really great question. Would Lua filter to nest lift data in a payload be as lightweight and efficient as using the nest filter? Uh, this is a, a great question around how does Lua processing compare to uh, fluent bit pipeline processing? And, and really what, what Thiago is showing here on this slide is two factors. One is on the performance side with Lua, you can do a lot more versatility and you only have a one-time penalty of converting from JSON to message pack, this internal format that FluentBit uses. Now within a FluentBit filter, you can nest multiple, or you can have multiple filters go one after the other, but actually you pay a performance penalty every single time you use a filter. With Lua, you pay that penalty just once. With other filters, you pay that every single time you need to do some sort of logic. So in essence, if you're doing a lot of transformation, a lot of processing, uh, Lua is gonna be way, way more efficient um, versus just using multiple fluent bit filters. In the end, it's all you know extremely lightweight, high performing, but if you're trying to get that, that super fine-tuned use case, even down to, to threading, right? It, um, there's another great question someone has. Hey, do we need to be an expert in C language? No. Do you need to be an expert in C language to use Linux? No. It's, it's the language that the tool is written in. The debugging and the operations are, are very much separate than the, the language it's written in. So that, that makes it easy to use, consume, build this really high-performing data pipeline in and then 
uh, being able to, to run operations. I'll put a plug for our next webinar, which will also be in another slide, which is around the operations monitoring performance of FluentBit. So how you can look at this and how we've seen uh, some of our users who have hundreds, 200,000 servers do this type of monitoring uh, and, and management as, as well with debugging. Uh, and I think one more question was, is there more general, but uh, it, it's great to answer here. Is there a reason for someone to use FluentD versus FluentBit? Uh, it's, it's a great you know, longer term question of like, hey, there's two projects here. Which one should I get started with? Well, with FluentBit, we've invested a ton of, of stuff to bring up that parity. Now with FluentD, there's a, again, a decade plus of community plugins, et cetera, that you might still wanna make use of that might still be, be available. With FluentBit, we've, we felt we've gotten up to that, that very, very high mark. We're always eager for community feedback where, that, uh, where we don't have that, that parity. And the other piece is really within the uh, metrics and traces. So FluentBit has that full support for Otel, Prometheus, this larger and, and big broad ecosystem. And so using FluentBit uh, is something we recommend if you're just starting out you know, versus a, a FluentD uh, because of that, that integration into this really deep and powerful ecosystem. Okay, let's go ahead and continue here. Okay, uh, so uh, one of the uh, problems with uh, uh, using too much Lua is that you end up copying and pasting a lot. Uh, uh, well, it, um, the, one of the ways that you can work around that is by installing Lua modules. Lua is a full programming language. It has its own package manager uh, that you can install third-party libraries. And fluent bit uh, filters can make use of that. So in theory, it's possible uh, that you write, if you have a script, uh, a Lua function that you use a lot in your processing, you can write a Lua module, a Lua package, and publish to Lua rocks, and then you can install it on any machine and simply use that and have a, sing a script in a single line or required. So, uh, this is something I'm going to talk about now. Lua is uh, has a lot of uh, packages that you can install, ready to use packages. Uh, something that is common in the Lua ecosystem is that the libraries, the packages, they uh, tend to be C bindings. They tend to bind directly to to uh, native libraries, so they are very high performance. Uh, and this is one example. Uh, this is actually one of the simplest examples of using Lua modules. We actually do have a repository of Lua samples showing how to use other modules. But in this case, we're uh, writing a filter that is calling OpenSSL library to compute a uh, cryptographic hash of the logs. So in this case, uh, on the first uh, uh, on the first code block, you're seeing how you can set this up on your machine or in your, your Docker file. Uh, whenever, whatever you're preparing the uh, Fluent Bit to, to run, uh, this is a Ubuntu or Debian example. You install some uh, LibSSL development headers, Lua Rocks, which is the package manager, and then you go Lua Rocks and install Lua OSSL, which is the Lua like uh, SSL bindings. And uh, you can see in the left that how, how it invokes, how you can invoke a, a package, how you can import a package. You just do a require and the name of the package, how it's registered in the system. Uh, this is, uh, as I said, this is one of the simplest examples. Uh, it also saw some interesting Lua features uh, that I have not talked about, but uh, I think it's interesting to see like Lua has closures functions as, uh, as objects. So you can see that this is a digest factory and it uh, returns a, 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 fact, a, a function that it simply computes the, the digest for the specified algorithm. So you see so you get to create MD5, SHA1, and SHA256. And then we simply uh, in the uh, CB filter, 
we simply add one field for each of these hashes, cryptographic hashes, and we compute the hash of the log field. And uh, we might link this later. There is uh, this was taken from the Fluent Bit samples repository, but there are much more advanced samples. There are sam there is an example of using XML processing. You can do a very efficient XML parsing with Lua. And uh, there are many more things. You can also import regular expression libraries, Lua socket, which is a networking library. So if you ever need to do networking calls with Lua, you can use something like Lua socket. So there is no limit with what you can do here. So one of the uh, Calypians has developed a, a, a playground, a Fluent Bit Lua playground, which allows you to interactively test Lua code. And uh, as uh, it's a simulated environment, like uh, on the left, you see, this is a screenshot. You can see uh, the link uh, on the top right. Uh, this is a, just to clarify, this is a web application. It's running uh, directly in the browser. There is no server. So this is using a Lua in browser implementation to emulate a fluent bit like environment to test. And as you type, as you make changes to either the inputs or, or the Lua filter, it's going to automatically update the output. And it's actually a quite simple uh, way to test Lua snippets and uh, and, uh, and learn a bit about Lua. So if you go to that, you're going to see this same sample. This is the default example. It's like the fees bus algorithm written in Lua uh, for fluent bit. So uh, now I'm going to talk about, about stream processing, which is another feature. Uh, it's not related to Lua. Basically, the simplest way to see it's fluent bit plus SQL. Uh, it's a, a very similar to SQL, it's a SQL like language. And it allows you to do some, some things that are not currently possible with Lua. Uh, so, if you look at this, uh, this diagram, uh, this is the, the basic thing to understand is that stream processor it operates when, uh, when records reach the storage. Uh, so, uh, after it reaches the storage, it hits the stream processor. And then you write SQL-like queries to filter or modify records that then can be ingested back into the pipeline before uh, going to the an output. So let's see some samples. Uh, so this is a very simple example. Basically, a stream is uh, uh, every, every input in fluent bit is associated with a stream. Usually, uh, the stream is the name of the tag that is assigned either by the input or by the user in the configuration. In this case, we are selecting every field from a stream called Apache. And in the second example, we're just selecting the code field, uh, but we are renaming it to HTTP status from every record that matches the tag Apache dot start. So yeah, when you in a SQL uh, database, when you select fields, it's only going to display these fields in, in stream processing. It's going to create another record that has a subset of the fields. Uh, in this, when you see this, only the select uh, statement, this is actually uh, just sending that, that selected data to the standard output. It's not actually creating another stream. So it's a good way to debug SQL like queries for plant bits. You write the select statement and you see standard output. But when, usually you want to do something like create another stream from the uh, SQL query. So uh, these are, these examples are showing that we're creating a new stream called hello from every uh, field of every record of the stream Apache. And this is something that goes back into the beginning of the pipeline 
so it goes through all, all the, the filters that match it. So if it's something that you, you can combine with another filter, but you have to keep in mind that you need to properly set and match uh, tags uh, for this. And uh, it's basically the same example as before, only it's fake and you stream. A good, a good question in the chat is post stream processing, does it go back to the input or does it only go back um, when a new stream is created? So, so this if, is if you, yeah, yeah. Ahead, if you ahead. just do the select, if you just do the select statement, it's, it doesn't create a new stream. It just sent the result of that to standard output. So it is a good way to debug, to develop the, the stream you're going to see in standard output. But usually you want to combine that with the create to create another stream. And yeah, it goes back to the input. It goes back to after the input. Like it's like another input that's uh, an artificial input. Yeah, some some use cases that I, I I've seen some folks talk about in the Fluent Slack channel that I think are are awesome. And uh, plug would love to chat with more folks who are looking to do the stream processing site too. Is you'll group a bunch of messages together. And you'll send those the outcome of the group messages as a new stream. So maybe doing some analysis about how many HTTP 200, 404s, 500s that you have within a certain window. Uh, doing alerting. So things like if you see an error, then have a new stream connected and have that stream only send data to Slack or, or an alerting mechanism. So a lot of really fun things that you can do with, with uh, stream processing. And, you know, stream processing is is something that we're always trying to build on top of too. So, really eager to to hear more about those those use cases. Uh, can you advance the slide to the yeah. Uh, those yeah that that's a simple. So this is a, a bit more complex example. It's basically uh, grouping records. So when you do a group select statement in a database. Uh, that's uh, just grouping the existing data. In the case of fluent bits, it's operating on, uh, on a stream of data, on a continuous stream of data. So we don't know how many records there will be. Uh, there can be uh, not many. Right? So this, in this case, the group, the aggregation in, in uh, stream processing is by using a time window. So in this case, imagine that there is a, a cities, uh, a bunch of records that represent cities, and this they have the country in each record. So in this case, we are grouping uh, the records uh, by by uh, by country. We're selecting the country and showing the count of cities that are in that uh, in that group in the, the existing data. But this is uh, using a time window of five seconds. So if all the records come all at once in a single file, it's going to group all that uh, correctly. But if it's coming uh, from a network or something like that, it's going to, these groupings going to happen in, in, in five second intervals. And this is actually something, I mean, I think stream processing is one of the ways that you can complement uh, Lua cannot do what stream processing does because Lua does not uh, Lua filters do not cannot ingest records back to the pipeline like stream processing does. So when you combine stream processing with Lua, I mean the uh, the sky is the limit with what you can do in processing with stream filters. Awesome. So yeah, let's happy to talk talk through some of the more questions that are coming through the chat. Um, is it fair to think stream processing as an aggregation engine opportunity? You yeah, would love to hear a little bit more. Maybe I could throw out a use case about what, what I mean by aggregation, which is, hey, I'm you know sending all this data, maybe a thousand records per second, but I only care about the high level notes about those records, the metadata about those records. So maybe how many unique IPs there are, how many um, total host names there are, and maybe you know, what the um, content, if, if content has X or content has Y in it. 
stream processing is a great way to condense and do the logic across those thousand events per second. So maybe you're getting syslog network traffic, and you can build that stream processing on, on top of with it. So that's a great way to, to really drive um, a lot of these, these things that you, you know, potentially need something really heavyweight uh, on the other end and do that within the, the agent itself. Uh, another great question, can you actually create back pressure or is it run in separate thread? Very good question. So uh, just some background, what is back pressure, right? This is fluent bid, it has uh, an interesting problem where it is so fast, high pressure, that sometimes backends can, can sort of say, I can't accept this much data. You're sending way too much, please slow down. And as it starts to fail those um, messages fluent bit starts to say, okay, I'm, I'm failing my, my sending of that data. I'm going to retry, um, which essentially creates this pressure, uh, in the system where it's starting to store that data. That's what the, the back pressure is. Now with stream processing, you're essentially taking those records and, and doing some computation on it and then resending it to, um, uh, the fluent bit pipeline to, to do more processing or send it again. And in that case, yeah, if you're doing a lot of processing on all these records and you're slowing down because the backend can't handle the, the traffic and you're buffering, you are essentially adding more input into that, that pipeline. So the, the processing, um, the, the filtering, all that can run in separate threads, but from a back pressure side, yeah, it's, uh, it, it is there. Um, it, it will increase that. So let's get into some of the, the demos. Um, here. So this is processing in the real world. I have three uh, use cases that we tend to see in the Slack channel or hear from the community all the time. I've got some sensitive information. I've got noisy logs. I need to add context to these logs. How can I go and, um, and enable any of these scenarios? Now, the great thing with Lua is you, know, you can, like Diago said, get this really great insight of what's happening internally, um, of what's happening in the record, use that conditionally to, to build some of that. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna share my screen here in another window. And in this window, I have a VM that's just pumping out a input stream of um, hello world. And then I have a configuration um, that I'm running here on the side. So the first one I'm gonna take a look at here is how do we do uh, redaction or how do we do um, enrichment of those logs with say a, a host name. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna modify the configuration here. And in this configuration within the Lua function, I'm gonna call a function to say, hey, go and get the host name. Uh, and add that host name to my record. So something I can only contextually get at the agent side. How do I go and add that into e each and every single record? So when someone searches, they know where this came from. So if I go ahead and save that, um, it'll go ahead and uh, repopulate this agent. And then this agent is gonna go ahead and say, great, I'm now adding this host name to each and every single one of my, my records. So that same hello world now has the um, host name that's, that's part of there. Now, if we look at the uh, sensitive information, um, that could be something like a credit card. It could be something like a, uh, it could be something like a social security number. There's always a, a large amount of uh, things that we might have for, hey, we don't want to send that outside of, uh, what we're doing. So let me grab this configuration here. And what we'll do is replace this. And in this configuration, you can see I'm outputting this uh, log say, here's my credit card number. It somehow made its way into the log. And I write a Lua function, very simple function to say, if I find some numbers, uh, go ahead and, and redact them. So let's look at it, what it looks like here without the um, specific um, without the specific uh, filter, and then we'll enable that filter and then see what, what happens. So it go, looks like it got loaded up and it's restarting. And great, here's my credit card number for everyone to, to go and see. 
let's go ahead and add some redactions so that way that doesn't happen anymore. So go ahead and delete this. And perfect, great. Now I'm redacting all of those credit card numbers that are coming in. Um, and and now it, it's uh, immediately there um, and not being shown. So everyone who does see these logs, they're just gonna see those, uh, those, those stars. Now let's go ahead and look at a more fun use case. So something that has uh, a lot of logs. This is probably one of the more, uh, more discussed use cases. So this is, I am outputting two streams. I have one that's saying debug world, and then I have error world. And I have a Lua filter, which we'll go ahead and comment out real quick. And what this is gonna output is debug and error. And those are gonna both start coming in um, at a pace about one per second, right? Maybe my debug in real in in the in real life would come in a hundred debugs per second or so, and essentially I don't really want those debugs, right? They're they're clogging up my system. They cost the same as an error log. They're not as useful, and I'm not really taking a look at them. So instead of capturing them, what I'll do is I will drop those. So with Lua, as uh, Diago mentioned, you can say, hey, if this this content contains this specific parameter we want to get rid of it. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of uh, debug and all I'm going to see are the errors, which at this stage come in at one per second. So no more debug showing up. If someone accidentally adds a debug, someone accidentally adds an info, that stuff is effectively uh, not, not being shown at all, um, or it's being skipped. So we're essentially skipping that. Now, another fun thing, which we'll cover in the next webinar too, is with metrics and monitoring, you can actually see from a Lua perspective how many of these messages are, are getting dropped. So you can see how many did I filter out? How many did I actually capture? What my savings are? What my uh, output looks like? So all of that is um, is available uh, within within this uh, this whole system. So uh, those are three examples. Uh, I have some gists that I'll, I'll um, paste here within that that YouTube, so you can copy and try out these these samples as well. Um, and then for this system, I was actually using our, our Ecliptic Core um, fleet management. So if you're interested in trying that out, uh, be sure to, to sign up. This is how we're, you know, if you have maybe a hundred servers, putting that same Lua rule across uh, all a hundred of them, we're uh, looking for, for folks who would wanna try that out. So 